All right. Uh, it's a it's a, a quite typical pr uh, problem uh, or a task which you will which one has to do uh, in uh, associated with the material which we uh, just discussed is called uh, uh, calorimetric calculations. And uh, calorimetric calculation is about figuring out how much heat was transferred from one system to another system when they, br when they were brought into a diathermic contact and heat was transferred. Uh, so I was thinking of maybe b solving, uh, uh, solving a, a problem and trying to, uh, to figure out what will, uh, what will happen. Yep, so now, uh, depending on this, if, we, uh, if, uh, assist, if one of the systems goes through, or actually it doesn't even matter, if we have a large, uh, several, num several uh, uh, systems and they are brought uh, together, because yeah, in calorimetric uh, calculations, usually, usually we have, uh, I mean, you will do it actually in an experiment uh, in the lab as well. So you will have, for example, container of water, and you will dip something hot into that. And uh, well, in order to find out uh, how much heat was transferred or uh, uh, what will be the final temperature, you will have to compare heats, heat uh, released by one uh, system and uh, uh, absorbed by another system. Um, now, depending on this, if there is a transition or a uh, phase transition or not, uh, the calculation will be slightly different because if, uh, if, there, is a f uh, if there is not transi a transition, you just really compare uh, heat transfer, uh, which you calculate based on the uh, changes in temperature. So how about if you think ab about an example in which we have uh, wa uh, water, a uh, certain amount of of water at one temperature, and we dip uh, uh, copper at another temperature. And the question is, what will be the uh, final temperature? What will be the equilibrium temperature? Um, formally, we haven't discussed it yet, uh, uh, that uh, heat is going to be transferred from a hotter to warmer. Uh, but in principle, in calculation, you don't even have to to, to think about it, you just have to recognize that when they get into equilibrium, and doesn't matter how, their final temperature of both systems is going to be the same. Um, you can look at this problem actually two ways. Either, I mean, probably the most uh, intuitive is that uh, one system gives up heat, and then you calculate how much heat this system gave up, and uh, then compare. Uh, to the uh, to the system which was colder initially and absorbed uh, heat, uh, I prefer actually to do it uh, to look at both system together into a super system. Uh, so I I recognize what part of a universe is isolated from the rest, and then I th then I think that that system does not ac absorb heat at all. And uh, so let's say that I put, uh, what did I say, copper into water, right? So let's say that I had a container which, conta which has uh, uh, m, uh, m grams of water, uh, so I express amount in terms of uh, mass, which in principle describes inertial property of that system. Uh, well, if it is water, I know its its properties. So, for example, I know wh what do I need uh, to figure out uh, uh, when it changes. Also, let's say that, that this water was initially at temperature T1, uh, H2O. Uh, let's uh, call it two, uh, THTO. And if I know that it's water, so I know it's... Uh, um, specific heat. And why would I choose specific heat, not molar heat capacity in this case? Because I express the amount of water in terms of uh, mass. If I express it in, uh, in terms of uh, number of moles, then I would, uh, it would be more useful to, to know uh, heat capacity, so molar heat capacity. So I also know specific heat of water. Um, and uh, if I dip here a uh, uh, 
piece of, of uh, copper like you are going to do it in the experiment, well, I, I will have to know how much, how much uh, of the copper I have, uh, what is its specific heat, and what is its initial temperature. Uh, <coughs> now, um, in principle, I should also include a container. Right, but I mean, uh, uh, so so it's possible that in the lab experiment you will have to include it. This w this would be a more accurate calculation because container, container water and this one eventually when they get into thermal equilibrium they all will have the same temperature. Uh, let's call this temperature T F. So T F is the final temperature of the system. Uh, and at the same time is the equilibrium temperature, which means that when all systems get that temperature, they will stop on average exchange heat and the temperatures will be fixed from, from, that, uh, from that point. Uh, so I suggested that, uh, actually how about if we include also aluminum here, so I will have to know how heavy, is, I mean how much uh, mass is in that container, what is the mass of that container, uh, what is specific heat, and well, actually, system contained water. Uh, it is reasonable to assume that it had the same temperature as as water, and probably in the experiment in the lab, you will you will start with everything probably at room temperature. Um, so how about the, this is al this also has temperature of water. Uh, so. The way, the way I do it, I recognize now that this system is a system which exchange uh, heat within it. So it's, it's isolated. So the heat delivered to this entire system is zero. It is just transferred from one subsystem to another subsystem. So I write that the heat transferred is zero. And now I write how much heat which of those subsystems uh, absorbed. Yeah, because the formula which uh, uh, you saw yesterday on the uh, whiteboard was uh, re uh, related amount of heat delivered to the system with the change, of tempera uh, change in temperature of that system. All right, so water therefore will absorb uh, Amount, uh, uh, amount of heat which is equal to uh, heat capacity of water, which requires multiplying mass of water by specific heat of water. This is heat capacity of that water which I have in the container. And now I have to write the change in temperature. And change in temperature, yeah, because the way I do is I always take final temperature minus initial temperature which means that it will be final temperature of water, which is this one, minus initial temperature of water. This is amount of heat absorbed by water. Uh, even, uh, I mean, it was, uh, and it was colder. Well, uh, aluminum will also absorb heat. So it will be mass of aluminum, specific heat of aluminum. Is that container times final temperature minus initial temperature. And now I will have to add uh, heat absorbed by that, by that, um, by that uh, piece. Now let's assume that this piece was warmer than that. So, so actually it is going to uh, to really to give up heat. Uh, but when I, with my approach, I don't even care about it. I just formally continue with the same way. So over here I will have, have mass of copper times specific heat of copper times change in temperature of, of copper. And change in temperature of copper will be that equilibrium temperature minus initial temperature of copper. Uh, um, note, actually, that this term, I mean, if, if, if that 
if initially this was this had higher temperature than water, so let's say that temperature of copper was greater than temperature of water. Uh, <coughs> now your intuition actually probably says, and it doesn't even matter over here. Uh, uh, but uh, well, because right now we obtained an equation which contains how many unknowns. Let's find out ho what we know and we don't know. Do we know amount of water? Yes, right? Do we know specific heat of water? Yes. Do we know final temperature of water? No. Do we know initial? Yes. How about uh, this? We know, we know, this is the same variable, so we don't know this one, we know this one. Now, over here we know what is the amount of, of uh, uh, copper, we know it's specific heat only, uh, and we know the initial temperature, so the only unknown here is uh, uh, that equilibrium temperature. Actually, it doesn't ha this doesn't have to be uh, yeah, because you can reverse somehow a problem and say that the final that you want a final temperature of 50, 50 Celsius. How much how much copper would you have to drop at a given temperature, or what should be the initial temperature of of uh, of uh, copper in order to get a particular uh, equilibrium temperature? Do you understand me? Right. Uh, anyway, <coughs> we got an. Right now we got an, uh, and then no matter what, we have to know the remaining uh, variables. So, so we can solve this problem only if there is only one unknown. Well, in, in the way I phrase the, the problem, we have only one unknown, and that unknown is that equilibrium temperature. Um, uh, and uh, well, so, so I see, I hope that you don't have a problem to solve it. It's a linear equation. Uh, you just group the terms and and find out the final temperature. So I'm not even going to, to do it. I just want to discuss it. Um, because uh, <coughs> if you do it without even thinking, or if you use your intuition, that equilibrium temperature, what can you say about this e equilibrium temperature? Yeah, let's say that the that, uh, piece of copper had temperature of 100 uh, degrees Celsius and water was at 20 degrees Celsius. Do you think that afterwards the temperature is going to be 200 uh, degrees uh, Celsius? No. Your, your experience says that and, uh, and formal calculation would lead to that too. But if you know and if you have experience, use, uh, take advantage of it and let's think about it now. Uh, so. Uh, what can you say about this temperature? Is it going to be, let's say, minus 5? No. What can you say about the temperature, the equilibrium temperature? It will be between, right? So, so uh, final temperature, therefore, is going to be somewhere between uh, initial temperature of copper and initial temperature of water. And now let's take a look at those terms. So. If we have such a situation, what can you say about this term? Is it positive or negative? The first term. And let's, uh, let's recall what actually this first term represents. And say it. I mean, I want you to say it. This is amount of heat, not in water, Absorbed by water, correct. This is amount of heat absorbed by water or transferred to water, right? Now, if, uh, if uh, final temperature is greater than initial temperature, it means that this difference is positive, right? Specific heat is positive. Amount of uh, water is positive. So mass is positive. All, terms, all factors are positive, so this expression is positive. Now, I want you to repeat the same phrase, what this term represents, and then just add, is positive. Say it. The amount of heat absorbed by water is positive, correct. Which means that absorbed took that water, uh, uh, took that heat. Now, how about this one? Well, here we have, again, the same uh, difference, so it's positive. All factors here are positive. The entire term is positive. Which why don't we now recognize what it represents? This is amount of heat absorbed by the aluminum container, right? So say it now. 
is positive because the term is positive. So, so the amount of heat absorbed by the aluminum container is positive. Now let's take a look at the final term. Over here I have final temperature minus, in, minus uh, final temperature of copper, which is final temperature of everything, uh, minus initial temperature of copper. And this time, initial temperature of copper is higher than final temperature, which means that this difference over here is negative. Now what the term represents? The amount of heat absorbed by copper. So now let's say what is the value of the, of the term. So amount of heat absorbed by that copper is negative. What does it mean? It means that it lost, not gained, right? So <coughs> if you approach it that way, remember always to put final minus initial, final minus initial, final minus initial temperatures. Uh, if you, yeah, because now, if you, uh, uh, if you think the other way, I mean, the other way, people actually try always to write, uh, to get positive numbers, positive amounts of heat. So, uh, so really, rather than having here final minus initial, they put, uh, oh, everywhere, they put higher minus lower. So always this term gets positive, and then you have to keep in mind, well, is what it was the system gaining temperature, uh, uh, increasing temperature, or uh, 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 lowering temperature? In other words, the heat was tr transferred to or from. Uh, problem is that sometimes you, you don't know. Yeah, because if I had more systems, I could, uh, I could make it... Uh, well, not obvious. If I add, oh, let, let's say that I, the uh, container was at temperature of 50 uh, degrees Celsius, I poured water uh, or put hot, uh, uh, hot uh, uh, copper into that and then poured water. Well, we wouldn't know really if final temperature is going to be less or more than the temperature of that aluminum container if it were at about 50 degrees. Do you, do you see that? So I suggest that you approach it this way. Uh, now, in case, <coughs> in case there is a phase transition, uh, well, you will, have, uh, you will have actually to, to think first if entire amount of, uh, uh, of substance going through that transition will do it. Yes, so for example, if you drop ice cube to, to, to uh, cold tea, or a lot of ice cube, yeah, half a, half a cup of, of uh, ice cube into, uh, into tea. Uh, well, in this situation, you, well, uh, like in a restaurant. In a restaurant, actually, you know what will happen, what will be the final temperature without any calculations. 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, correct. Uh, it's better to use Celsius because the tables which give specific heat, they are, uh, they they are for Celsius. So it's okay to use Fahrenheit. Uh, it's just a little bit uh, more uh, hassle to, to calculate. Uh, but it's simple as well. All right, so how did you know that? Well, that in the restaurant, because at the end, at the end, we will have a mixture of water and ice, and they will be in equilibrium. Uh, yeah, uh, the waiter actually takes care of it that they, that they will be in equilibrium. If they don't do it, you are upset, right? Because if somebody gives too little ice, we are upset. We want to make sure that we have excess of ice so that the temperature of cocoa or, or this iced tea is uh, zero degrees uh, Celsius. Um, um, okay, so actually in this situation, uh, <coughs> well, we can ask ourselves how many cubes do we need to, to put uh, in order to, to cool off, let's say, uh, tea, which was initially at room temperatures, is about 20 degrees Celsius. 
uh, and uh, well, in a cup we know how much uh, how much tea we, we have. So how much ice do we need to add? Well, the minimum amount the minimum amount will be therefore that uh, all ice melts, but the temperature doesn't doesn't rise, right? So this will be the minimum amount of ice which is needed. Um, so what will be the final temperature? Zero, correct. So over here, uh, as long as uh, one of the systems doesn't go through the transition, you find out the temperature, uh, the, the, the temperature, uh, final temperature as the tr temperature at which transition occurs. Um, now, actually, you can have a problem which is combined. So let's say that you put an, just one ice cube into a large container. Uh, so uh, the temperature, the initial temperature of that liquid phase could be sufficient to melt the ice and then heat the remaining, uh, uh, the remaining water. Uh, then you will have to combine, actually, uh, uh, both uh, this calculation and the calculation for um, um, for the uh, phase transition. All right. Yeah, so how about if you think about it? Yeah, so let's say that we take, we, we take a certain amount of water and we drop an ice cube and, and let's find final temperature assuming that this entire, that the amount of, uh, of ice is insufficient to cool entire container to zero. Right, so what would be then different? Uh, so now this is ice cube. Uh, for simplicity, let's think that we even do it in aluminum container. Uh, so we drink it from aluminum container. Uh, <coughs> so, but this, the, and actually, yes, or how about if we find, find out now expression for the, this was what? Heat absorbed by water. Do we have to change the term over here? No. no. Yeah, if you approach it that way, you don't have to do it. Except, it, I mean, it changed itself automatically. Do you see it? It changed to what? To a negative value because this time the initial temperature of water is higher than the final temperature of water. So this expression now is going to be negative which means that the heat absorbed by this liquid water is going to be negative, so in reality it gives up heat. All right, let's now think about uh, the uh, cup, the aluminum cup from which we drink. Uh, do we have to make a change over here? No, we don't. It automatically changes itself. Do you see that? To what? to a negative value, correct? Because now again, final temperature of the cup is going to be lower than initial. Uh, now, <coughs> we, have, we have to get rid of that. Uh, well, actually, we don't even need to get rid of that, except that we have to change it to, to ice. Uh, so let's put it that this is ice cube, not just ice. Now, <coughs> however, we need to change that, yeah, because that expression was with an assumption that the ice cube doesn't go through phase transition, right? So let's say that I had this ice cube at minus 5 degrees Celsius. Uh, so I will put here that initial temperature of ice cube, but the formula will be valid only until we approach the temperature of phase transition. So I cannot put here final temperature. I have to put a temperature of transition temperature. For ice cube, it is going to be zero degrees Celsius. So actually, I have to put zero degrees Celsius over here. All right. So. This expression gives me the amount of heat which was delivered to ice cube, and I don't even think if it was really delivered or not, I'm always saying delivered, uh, to raise the temperature of the ice cube from, from initial 
uh, temperature to temperature of, uh, of the transition. Then the ice cube is, goes through the transition, right? So I will have another term which will tell me how much heat it needs to absorb to go through the transition. Uh, so what do I have to put here? Mass of the of water or ice? Ice of this ice cube, right? And I have to multiply it by. Yeah, what do we call? Uh, what do we call? Yeah, it's L. What do we call it? Latent heat of ice oh, of water, really. So latent heat, heat of water, uh, water. So this will give me the amount of, uh, of uh, heat which that ice cube is going to absorb when it goes through the transition. And then w when it goes through the transition, it will warm up to the final temperature. Right? So what do I have to put now? Mass of water, uh, well, of ice times specific heat, but of liquid water now, and what temperature difference do I have to put now? Automatically, the first one should be the one which we end, right? So it will be that equilibrium temperature minus, and here we have to start with the, I mean, the, the, the initial temperature for which this uh, heat was in, uh, 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 absorbed. Zero. Correct. So this way we will uh, find out uh, uh, final uh, temperature. Now, well, mathematically, actually, you can, you can obtain now the solution no matter what. And if, uh, now let's see uh, what kind of value we can, I can get over here. Well, if I will get here f that the final temperature will be uh, below zero, because indeed it is possible from this equation to choose such values f f uh, for, for the given quantities that if I use this formula, I will get this value less than zero what it would mean yes that the formula is not valid this term actually should not be included at all it means that you got so much ice that not all ice would be uh, uh, would be uh, melted yes yeah, so if you get a result final result for, for which violates uh, 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 which is irrational, I mean, in the sense that it's illogical, doesn't make sense. It means that you included something which didn't happen, uh, because this calculation would be appropriate for an assumption that entire ice cube melts and, uh, uh, and then the water which we obtained from melting it still uh, is heated up. Uh, all right. Um, now I would like to, uh, maybe there's one more uh, topic which I want to discuss in this, in this chapter. And it's, um, it's I want to, uh, to talk about a very important system actually, uh, because this system allows us to understand how engines work, for example. Um, I wanted to talk ab ab about uh, uh, gas uh, and uh, and uh, how much heat uh, um, and uh, how much work gas can perform. Um, I'll start with a more general topic first, uh, which is called the thermodynamic process. If we have a certain system, and it, when uh, we can imagine actually that it is changing. Uh, so, for example, when it expands or when it increases temperature, it is changing. Uh, if all, the, all those thermodynamic parameters uh, uh, which we associate with the system 
have a certain value, we say that a system is in a particular state. Yes, so for example, if our body right now is a in a particular state, it is under certain, uh, certain uh, stress. Uh, stress in my body is comparable to atmospheric uh, pr pressure. Uh, atmospheric pressure really determines what is the stress in my body. Uh, I have a particular temperature and whatever else describes me, I mean my, my volume, I have a particular volume. So all the parameters which uh, of, uh, I mean all the quantities which are associated with my body now uh, and uh, <coughs> determine my state. Uh, however, it can change. I mean, I, don't, I, I prefer that my, my body doesn't uh, change the state, but for example, may I borrow this? Yeah. This seven up, for example, if it is standing over here, it is changing, let's say, at least temperature, right? It warms up standing in the atmosphere. Uh, so at each point, it is in a different state. If something like this happens, that the system changes its state over time, we say that it goes through a, a thermodynamic process. And, <coughs> well, we have to use certain parameters. I mean, these parameters are really physical quantity, like I, like I mentioned already, let's say volume, temperature, and pressure. Uh, so how about if I think about it? Yes, yeah, so if a system is, is in a particular state, I can mark it. That mark that state in this coordinate system, in which while I will use coordinates which refer to uh, pressure, volume, and temperature. Well, in a, in a process, it can change. Uh, so here I have uh, different pressure, different volume, and different temperature. So the state of the system did change. And I can continue and, and uh, and that line, which defines uh, those values uh, uh, in time, is referred to as the thermodynamic process. Process is actually a sequence. It's a function. The argument is time, and the value of the function are the, po the states through which it, uh, it goes. And uh, well, I would like to to discuss uh, to uh, to discuss uh, three processes today in a, in gas. And actually, I uh, I mean, like we we do it all in physics and and uh, engineering. Uh, whatever we present is always approximated, and we have to know to to what uh, how far we uh, that approximation is extended and. Uh, yeah, because we, we have to know at what point we have to, uh, well, what kind of limits we can give for those approximations so that the environment is safe to us. Um, but idealizing the nature makes uh, calculations simpler. Uh, so, an ideal gas is a system which actually does not exist in reality, but a lot of gases behave very closely to that. It's the same thing like with, with, uh, uh, with ideal fluid, for example. That fluid also does not exist, but even water behaves very closely. Yeah, one of the things which, which water does uh, fail to, to uh, it is that it is not incompressible and, and vortices can be created in water. Uh, Ideal gas, uh, well, the most important thing which I want you to know about an ideal gas is that it follows a particular equation of state. Uh, pressure, volume, and temperature in an ideal gas are related. If you take a certain amount of gas, and it is expressed here by, the, by this number n, it says how many, uh, 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 what is the amount, how many moles of gas we have. So N stands for the amount of gas. Uh, T stands for temperature of the gas. P is pressure of the gas. And V is volume of the gas. Um, proportionality coefficient between these, two, uh, these four uh, uh, quantities is called universal gas constant. And it has a fixed value. 
so if a gas satisfies this equation, we say that it is ideal. Uh, there is no gas which accurately satisfies that, but a lot of gases in wide range, uh, I mean, for, for, for a lot of gases, we can really use this formula. Uh, and uh, I mean, definitely for air, actually, to, to, to quite high pressures. Um, well, uh, what is really required from the gas to, to satisfy this equation, I mean, if we look at the microscopic uh, structure of the gas, it is that it is that this gas is a system of particles which don't interact except for collisions. Uh, important, I mean, if you think about, uh, uh, if you try to imagine that, it means that the that the particles in the systems don't have potential energy. It is that if they interact, they immediately, I mean, they collide, so, so, so energy is not stored in the form of potential energy. The only, uh, the only uh, energy which uh, ideal gas can have is kinetic energy of the, of the particles. <coughs> All right. Uh, and now for the rest of this, uh, of this lecture, I want really to analyze uh, this gas, uh, I mean gas which satisfies this equation. And actually, because of this equation, uh, which was uh, first derived experimentally and it was a long time ago in the 17th century, um, we formalized temperature using this equation. Why th this? Why we use? Yeah, because now look at look at this equation. Uh, that uh, well, for a fixed volume of of a certain amount of gas, pressure and temperature are proportional. Now they have to be now proportional. In the past, it was just an experimental uh, result. Uh, 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 people noticed that, but now. Since we defined temperature through the pressure of an ideal gas, well, they have to be proportional. Uh, now, I want to talk about uh, three pro today about th three processes which uh, which uh, um, which are very important for for uh, well for an analysis of uh, systems uh, containing ideal gas. Um, the first process is, uh, is called an isothermal process. And actually, we will discuss uh, the three processes which we are going to discuss are isothermal, isobaric, and isochoric. Um, isochoric is actually not often, uh, often not used, and in the book, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it refers to as a process at constant volume. But I wanted actually to say isochoric for a particular reason. Because whenever you, s you, you see iso in front, it means that, that whatever follows is constant. Um, although whatever follows is not, not particularly precise. Because isothermal, this thermal refers to temperature. Uh, so isothermal means a process with a constant temperature. So what will happen, uh, how the, the, other, the remaining parameters are related when the temperature of the process uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, in the, the system is maintained at constant temperature, uh, describes isothermal process. Well. So if we look again at the uh, equation of state for an ideal gas, now if we take a certain amount of gas, which means that the number of moles of, those, of that gas is going to be constant. Uh, gas constant is constant by definition. In an isothermal process, temperature is maintained constant. It doesn't mean, however, that we don't have to heat that system. 
we have to deliver energy or take away energy from, from gas in order to keep its temperature constant. Uh, which means actually that, sp that what is the heat capacity of that, of that gas when it goes through an isothermal process consulted with each other. Yeah, in an isothermal process, temperature does not change. However, uh, uh, heat has to be delivered or, or uh, taken away. And actually, I can tell you uh, what happens. Uh, you can figure it out, yes, yeah, so because probably, I mean, it, some of you probably knows what will happen if we compress gas. And, well, if you had a bicycle, you were compressing gas in the pump. If, if the tire were flat and you were fixing tire, you used the pump to, to push air into that, into that tire. C did you feel something on the pump? Who was doing it? Oh, you, you did that, right? And you felt that, actually you did, uh, Mark said that he felt heat. Well, I buy that. Uh, but could you be, I mean, how about, what did he really mean by, by heat? Which, which heat did he feel? Because I, I suspect that, that Mark is confusing heat with something else, although, I can also I can also imagine that that he means uh, right. I bet that he means wrong, but <laughs> sorry, Mark, but I uh, but I yes yeah, so I want now to 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 justify it yeah because what he did he feel and and what really I mean. Uh, no no he didn't feel pressure. No he really f had uh, he really felt that the pump becomes warm, right. This is what he felt. Well, warmth is not heat. Yeah, if he felt that it's warm, then it meant that the air in the pump and the pump changed its temperature. Yeah, so the temperature was higher. However, let's try now, let's try to defend Mark because what he said is also reasonable. What heat did he feel? Which one? Not friction. The heat was transferred from something to, to something. So he, he from the air to the to the to, to not to the tire to his hand, right? Yeah, because this is how we recognize that something has higher temperature because when we touch it, we will feel the warmth, right? We will feel indeed the heat transferred from the pump to the hand. Correct, which will be an indication that the temperature of the air in that pump is higher, right? So, so you saw that you, you, Mark at least experienced it that when he compressed air in that pump, temperature increased. Well, if temperature increased, was it an isothermal process? Why not? Because the temperature was not constant, so that if the temperature was not constant, so the process was not uh, isothermal. Well, so in, if we compress us, uh, a gas, what would we have to do in order to, uh, to keep temperature constant? We would have to take away that heat, right? It would lower temperature of the gas. So, so if, if we... If we want to compress gas isothermally, we have to take heat away from the gas. Uh, with an expansion, it's the other way. If we expand gas, then it cools, uh, lowers the temperature. So in order to have it uh, at constant temperature, we'd have to deliver uh, heat. Uh, all right. Now, if temperature is constant, an amount of gas and, and uh, I mean, the right-hand side is constant, which means that in the process, only pressure and volume change. However, they don't change independently. They are related to each other, right? And now, how? So how about if you write down pressure as a, vo as a function of volume, which means that I have to divide both sides by volume, and then pressure at volume V will be 
this constant divided by v, by volume. Uh, if I wanted to plot this function, what kind of curve I would obtain? That one. And uh, is there a name? Does it have a name? Hyperbola. Yes, so inverse function is, I mean, the plot of inverse function, uh, I mean, one over uh, argument gives a hyperbola. Um, well, so, so this would be a, a, a how volume and pressure depends. Increasing volume lowers pressure, but not proportionally. At small volume, actually changes of uh, drastic at large volumes are, uh, are uh, they, they, they are small. Uh, uh, so for example, if I, <coughs> if I use a vacuum pump, to evacuate certain certain uh, uh, certain container. Well, what what a pump really does it is that it kind of makes the volume for the gas larger and larger and larger. How much? So let's let's say that I have a container uh, which uh, has a, uh, at atmospheric pressure. I have I have air. And uh, let's say that it contains uh, one cubic meter of, of that air. The container has, so it's, it's a container with a volume of one cubic meter. And let's say that it has air at, a, at a atmospheric pressure. And I will connect now a pump, which, which pumps at a rate of one cubic meter per second. No, that's too much, uh, uh, too fast. I mean, it would be really fast pump. Uh, so how about if it pumps, uh, let's say that, that we have such a pump. We have a pump which pumps uh, uh, one, uh, but we can say one cubic meter per minute. Okay? Now, how much time, what will be pressure in that, uh, I mean, uh, oh no, uh, what will be pressure after one minute in that container? How much? Who votes that it's zero? Well, the, and I comprehend what I just said, what the pump does. The pump really increases the volume. Yes? So, so what the pump does, if, if, the, pump, uh, if the pump has a, a, a rate of working of one meter per minute, it means that it, in, it increases the volume by one meter. So what would be the pressure according to this formula after one minute? Yeah, because I mean I set you in a trap, which I fell into this trap too. I mean it was obvious if it pumps one cubic meter per minute and we have only one cubic meter of gas, then after one minute it should be empty. But it's not like that because really what the pump does it increases the volume for that gas by one cubic meter. So now that amount of of air which previously was in one cubic meter, now it is in two cubic meters. So what's the pressure? Only half of that what was before. Now figure out how much time would we need to empty that one cubic meter. Look at the plot. Never. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, because it asymptotically approaches zero, we would have to pump forever until the volume grows to infinity. All right. Now, if I change, uh, all right, uh, what will happen now if uh, at the beginning of the process I change the, the temperature uh, of, uh, of, of the process? Well, if I lower temperature, then actually at a given volume, pressure will be, will be lower but it will still be a, a hyperbola, and hyperbola for, uh, for increased pressure. Isobaric process, and now baric refers to pressure. Actually, we have a unit of, of pressure which is called bar. Uh, so isobaric means that what is constant? Pressure, it is at constant pressure. So if we start again at the same expression, this is constant number of moles is constant and gas constant is constant. So how pressure and volume are related? 
Well, if I solve for volume at, ins at particular temperature, I recognize that they are proportional. So if I plot volume ver versus temperature, I have to get linear function. And note, actually, now this temperature is a temperature expressed on the Kelvin scale, not, not on the, uh, I mean, I, for I forgot to say that the ideal gas uh, law refers to temperature expressed in Kelvin. It has to be abs absolute temperature. So uh, if, I, if I take this one cubic meter of, uh, of, uh, of gas, and uh, if I go to something which is, I said, already impossible to do, lower temperature to zero Kelvin, how much gas am I going to have? I mean, what will be the volume of that gas? It will shrink to zero, right. All particles, we, I can group all particles into tiny, tiny corner of that, of that uh, uh, space. Now, depending on pressure, we can see that, that pressure determines the slope for a given amount. So if I uh, have a higher pressure, that a given temperature will have lower volume or the other way. Now, the, the last process which I wanted to discuss is called isochoric, and isochoric refers, choric refers to volume. So this is process with constant volume, which means that pressure and temperature are somehow related. And how they are related? Well, I have now to, let's say, I express pressure as a function of temperature it's going to be a linear function as well. This equation really uh, uh, de decides how we measure temperature nowadays. Uh, so if I plot pressure versus temperature, I will also get a, a straight uh, line. And now depending on this, how much volume I will give for that gas, uh, the slope is going to be different. So if I have the same amount of gas and I squeeze it, uh, so this number will be smaller, uh, sorry, larger, so the plot will be steeper. If I, make, if I expand it, it will be uh, less steep. This will be all for today. Thank you and see you tomorrow.